Um, hi everyone, my name is Christian Saladek. I'm a Cody builder at Chebos and based in Toronto and part of the URI team. Um, Pavel? Hello, my name is Pavel Schlager and I work as a productization engineer in Red Hat. Thanks guys for joining us for this session. So, go ahead. <laughs> Alright, so this talk is about Chebos URI. Um, it's a framework to build pure um, build web applications in pure Java. So you might say, oh my god, that guy, is gonna, <laughs> that guy is gonna show us another Java web framework. And that's true, but only partly. <laughs> because Orion really takes a fundamentally different approach to web development. Because traditional frameworks really saw the browser as a, as a rather dumb client that would just display content that was generated on the server. And over time, we did move a little more uh, behavior in the client, um, but uh, with Arai, we're trying to do uh, way more of that. Um, so we don't see the browser as being a distinct entity with limited resources, because obviously that's no longer true. What we see is that the JavaScript engines get faster and faster. The browsers uh, have access to more computational power than they had ever before. Um, we see that the worst compatibility <coughs> nightmares are over. So really what we want to do is move more application code, more application logic into the browser. So what does that mean? Um, it also means that ideally we want to be able to share code. We don't want to write the domain model twice. We don't want to write the validation logic twice. So we want to share as much code as we can with the server. So what does that mean? On the server, we really see Java still being the number one language, especially in the enterprise. Uh, not only because Java has proven to scale well to large code bases, mainly because of its static type nature, we also know that uh, Java has a large talent pool and an amazing ecosystem which makes it uh, very appealing for traditional uh, large-scale Java enterprise development. Um, so if we use Java on the server, we can obviously have the problem that we can't use it on the client because, you know, the Java applet thing didn't work out very well. So it would be nice if we could compile it to JavaScript. So what Arai does is it leverages the Google Web Toolkit compiler to compile parts of your application to JavaScript, so parts, parts that you define. It, um, the good thing about GWT or the Google Web Toolkit is that it uh, also takes care of cross-browser support for you. It compiles different permutations of that JavaScript for each browser separately. Um, and also applies a lot of heavy upfront optimization so that the JavaScript that comes out of the compiler is way faster and way smaller than any JavaScript you write by hand. Um, we also get Gwix development mode, which has a code and refresh development ability, and, and we'll demo that in a second, and also allows you to debug your client and server side code as Java code in your IDE. So a lot of people shy away from using the Google Web Toolkit. Uh, for numerous, numerous reasons, most of them are, most of them are wrong. Um, one reason is that people believe that if you write uh, client-side code in GWT, you have to use some kind of programmatic UI like in Swing. But it's not true at all. You can use uh, the, the DOM elements directly, you can use markup, and we'll also have an example for that uh, later on. And it's also not true that you have some sort of server-side or any kind of runtime dependency. Because once the GWT compiler is done compiling your app and packaging it, you really end up with static content. You really end up with JavaScript files. So at runtime, you don't have any dependency to GWT if you don't want to. Um, so I'm not here to talk about GWT. We just use it as a tool. So, so what is Arai? In Arai, what we're really focused on is the development experience. So we believe in a declarative programming model where you just define a structure of the app and the framework really um, helps you uh, building or, or generating code and building that app for you, at least um, at least write parts of it. And we believe that boilerplate sucks. So you shouldn't ever have to write any code multiple times that really doesn't add any value to, to the program you're trying to write. Um, and as I said before, we want to share code. We want to code um, to implement uh, classes and, and behavior once and share it between the client and the server. So what we do, what did we do? Um, the first thing the first thing we did is we have uh, existing Java EE APIs that we made available on the client. 
which means that if you're a server-side developer, you can uh, use a lot of that existing code, and we en enhanced Grid to make that code compatible to JavaScript, so you can use it in the browser. And we have a marshalling system that's uh, super flexible and really goes uh, out of your way. And communication mechanisms that um, tie all these pieces together. So enough of that uh, strategy and theory, let's look at some code. So here we see uh, a CDI event. If you, so CDI is the context independent injection standard that shares R299. If you're an existing Java E developer, you've seen this code before, but even if you're new, new to this world, it should be fairly intuitive. Um, what we see here is we inject an event for, uh, of type document and call it an updated document event. And when we, we attach a click handle to a button, so when that button is clicked, we just fire that event. That is just an example to show that although this is CDI code that's usually on the server, this compiles to JavaScript and uh, you can use it in the browser. Now, when you fire an event, you want to listen to it somewhere. So you want to add an observer. So this is all you need to do to observe events. You just take any method and annotate uh, a method parameter with, uh, with observes document. So this method will be invoked any time an event is fired. And here is the twist. So that event, when you fire it, um, you can observe it on the client or on the server or both. Because with Array, that CDI event is actually sent across the wire. So now you have a full distributed eventing system based on that standard pro programming model. And that the, the main point of this particular feature is to point out that Array is about this uniform programming model on the client and the server. Use the same code. Don't worry about whether it's client or server side code. Um, further, this is another uh, CDI feature. Just now in the browser, you're able to do dependency injection. And more often than not, you, you need more control over what is injected. So in the previous example, we saw that we injected an event for document, and the container just provided that for you. But often, uh, you, you, you need more control before that injection happens. So here we inject uh, and just qualify the supported and supported base widget. And then we write this producer method that says, you know, when an HTML, uh, HTML5 canvas is supported, use that instance, and if not, use that other instance. And now any, anywhere in your application, you would just inject that base widget, and you automatically get the right instance. So that's just another st standard CDI feature um, in, in the browser. So with events, we, like, I, like I said, you, you already have a way of communicating between the client and the server in a loosely coupled manner. But more often than not, you want some more, some, some tighter coupling in your application, especially if you're uh, communicating uh, on, on the basis of a business interface. So Array RPC is an RPC mechanism that you would use in that case. And it's very low on boilerplate. So if we, if we take a look here, what, what does it take to, to set up an RPC request? The first thing is we need a business interface. We call it the happy service here. And we annotate it with remote. And it says share, because what we do is we share the interface between the client and the server. So both the client sees it and the server sees it. On the server, we'll just implement that interface and annotate our implementation with service that exposes an RPC endpoint. That's it. And now if we, now if we invoke uh, that service, now on the client, we want to call out to that remote uh, feature call. Um, we inject a caller for that very uh, same service. So we use that interface on the client to provide us with a type safe way to invoke an RPC method. Because you see here that the caller um, has, uh, the, the caller provides you uh, with a call method and then returns the actual type of the interface. So you can actually invoke the interface method on a proxy on the client. Um, the only little bit of boilerplate we have here is that asynchronous callback. Um, there is no way around it as of now in Java. Um, it needs to be an asynchronous request because obviously you can't freeze the UI while we're waiting for the remote call to, to finish. Um, if Java 8 ever gets those Lambda things, then we might have a chance of now making this nicer. Um, the underlying communication in Array RPC, um, it uses our message bus. 
So for many people, um, especially coming out of a plain HTML and JavaScript world, they prefer some plain HTTP REST-based communication. And it turns out that in Array, you can use the same RPC mechanism, but not using the bus, using plain HTTP. So what you would do is you would annotate your remote interface, just remove the remote, and annotate it with Chuck's REST annotation. So that's the Java standard for RESTful web services. So you just uh, annotate it with path, so that request responds to slash customers, and annotate uh, the methods with the corresponding uh, HTTP methods. And on the client, we again see that it checks caller, so that's the very same as with RIRPC, only in this case, the communication when you call create customer follows that HTTP um, specification you added to that interface, to that business interface. So here you get a full um, HTTP uh, REST-based uh, RPC mechanism. And the cool thing here is that you don't see any serialization or regress logic at all, because all that code is generated for you in, uh, in the proxies, which makes it really easy to change your uh, URL or path layout, because uh, all you do is uh, change the HTTP path on that interface, or refresh uh, your browser, and you don't have to change any client code, it will just work. Um, so I already mentioned that there is no serialization logic, um, and, but we only return the Boolean and the long in these two examples, so that's not very impressive. But of course you can return or send any type across the wire in Array. So all it really takes is one big annotation. That's what we call it, it's called portable. So that person is a simple pojo, uh, plain old Java object, you've seen it many times, it's not very spectacular. You just add that portable annotation. But it gets better. So the Array, you can now just remove the getters and setters, and it's still a serializable uh, being. Uh, you might say, yeah, I've seen marshalling frameworks that do that, so it's not uh, that much better either. But it goes a lot further. Here's one more example where we actually serialize an immutable entity. So immutable types, as many of you will know, are a good idea in your app, because you want to really limit that surface on which bugs can occur. So the less mutable state you have, even in a, even in a, a single threaded environment as JavaScript, it still limits like, the chance that you run into serious bugs later on. So here we have a being with a private constructor, no setter methods. Um, you're using that factory method to create an instance. Once that instance is created, you can no longer change it. Um, but the only twist, uh, the only thing we need here is that when you create um, that person, um, we need that meta parameters need to be qualified with max2 so the marshalling system knows which parameter of the factory method maps to which field of the beam um, because apparently uh, we, we can't infer that. Okay, so that was a lot of talk about the core functionality. Let's give Pavel a chance to, to, to show this as a demo. It's okay, okay. Let's, let's, switch. Switch. let's switch the cables. So what Paolo is going to do, he's going to uh, use uh, Forge, which is our, our rapid application development tool in JBoss. And he's going to start with an Array project from scratch. And he's going to show you, I think, how to exchange a CDI event between the client and the server. Okay. So uh, what uh, I will try to show you, uh, it's just a fast bootstrap uh, of uh, Array CDI application. And uh, what you can see here, it's just... Uh, an empty JBDS studio, so uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but we want uh, to uh, create some project, so uh, uh, I will show you how to make the fast bootstrap, how the project structure looks like, uh, and then we will. Uh, I've prepared sample applications, so we will briefly go through the code, and uh, then I will show uh, how it works. Okay, so this is a, a Forge console. First, uh, we need uh, to uh, install a Forge RI plugin. Um, uh, I'm offline now, so I will source it. Uh, okay. So right now you can see that uh, Forge plugin, Forge RI plugin uh, will be installed. Okay. The next thing uh, you need to uh, create uh, some new project. Uh, yeah, we just name it Redemo CDI. Uh, we create uh, with this uh, with this package, and 
we just uh, create uh, in the defined project folder. So let's just create it. See, uh, there was created uh, the RI demo CDI project. So look, look what was created. Oh no! <laughs> look what was created right here. So it's just like. Oops, again. <laughs> that went wrong. Let's delete it. <laughs> All the content. <laughs> Let's create it again. We want to have an empty project. <laughs> OK, see, it's empty. Nothing is in there. Yeah, as uh, Christian was mentioning, the boilerplate sucks. Yeah, so uh, how to set up uh, the project really fast? We have an array, uh, an array plugin. We just uh, use the array CDI setup in here. Yes, what was done? See uh, all the necessary dependencies. We're just uh, brought in what you need for the Arai CDI project. Uh, maybe I'm, I will just make it a bit bigger. Is it better? Oh, yeah, I guess so. Uh, the Grid Maven plugin was uh, just set up for us, and the Maven Clean plugin for just cleaning the project. These are just really basics. What was uh, created additionally? See, there was created uh, the config file, what, uh, what we need for the application. Again, uh, all, the, all the modules and uh, what is needed for the application is just brought in. And see, <coughs> we type two commands and we have like half project set up. So what we need more. So we need, oops. Yeah, like that. Okay. We need set up properties. That's what missing there. And the properties which are needed uh, for the uh, for the RI project, like the RI properties, service properties. Uh, like log for j and all those basic properties were uh, brought in. So that's, uh, you can see, that's pretty much about structure, but what's missing here, actually some coding, you know. Uh, as I told you uh, already, I prepared uh, some application. Uh, so let's just uh, speed it up and copy paste it there. Just refresh it. And you can see um, for the error application, like uh, three basic packages, like the local, shared, and server. Uh, actually, uh, what's, uh, what's in the local and shared package, uh, it uh, gets uh, compiled uh, to JavaScript. And uh, what's, uh, uh, what's on the server stays on the server. So just uh, let's check the application and just go briefly through it. Uh, we have an application which is uh, annotated uh, by entry point annotation. This means that uh, this, is, uh, this is our uh, main error application. Uh, what is uh, again uh, like uh, important thing here is uh, we are annotating the build UI method. With the post construct, it means uh, that once application is started, uh, this method will be uh, invoked after uh, after construction. You can see here, like uh, here is uh, some UI stuff like label, button, and text box, uh, which uh, we are in this built UI uh, method adding uh, to the to the root panel, so it uh, it gets rendered after the application starts. 
uh, yeah, uh, in here uh, we are just uh, for the uh, to the button adding the click handler uh, and we are firing message. Uh, uh, we are calling fire message uh, method in here. So where the hell the CDI is? <laughs> I'm just talking five minutes and no CDI in here. So in this fire message uh, method, the CDI takes place. You know, you you could see right here. We are actually injecting the event uh, of hello message uh, type here, and uh, that's uh, what uh, we are creating the hello message uh, object here and sending it, uh, like firing the, the message event right here. Let's check what the hello message actually is. So you can see that just uh, a regular bean, and uh, that's uh, annotated with the portable annotation. Christian, he was already mentioning it here, uh, that uh, this uh, portable annotation is important uh, how to get a message uh, from a client to server. So uh, OK, we just got a message uh, to the server. So let's check uh, actually what's on the server side. So you can see that's just uh, here is uh, like simple service which has a handle message uh, method uh, uh, with the observes annotation. So we are actually in this method we are observing uh, for any uh, hello message event and uh, what we are doing uh, just simply once we are uh, receiving this event uh, we will uh, respond. Uh, so if you uh, if you pay the good attention, you might uh, actually notice uh, on the on the app Java file that uh, we are uh, we are observing there for the response event. So it's right here. So it's just basically it. So let's try and show if it runs or if it blows. <laughs> All right. So right now what I'm starting, uh, I'm starting uh, uh, GVT dev mode, uh, just, <laughs> okay, okay, <laughs> it happens, <laughs> usually on the presentation, you know, you run it like 100 times. <laughs> OK. Let's try to find out what, what was actually. I'll try to show it from the backup. Okay, so all right. Okay, we need to kill this one. Let's try to show it from here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, so apparently there was something wrong. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, hmm. uh, Let's try it again from here. The, fir the third and last try, OK? somewhere. 
right here. Okay. Not well, found. Really yeah, okay. Prepared. Yeah, whatever. Sometimes the demo gods are not good to you. You have to sacrifice the chicken first. So obviously, <laughs> you forgot to do that. <laughs> so, um, I guess we'll... All right, uh, guys. I'll, let's I'll let's switch. <laughs> yes. And, um, the second demo. Um, all right. So before uh, we dive into how to build user interfaces, how to build actual client code, that looks nice and can be uh, shown to your clients. Um, I think Paula could try to do it with. Uh, yeah, well, actually, you know, we were, me and Christian were mentioning here like uh, two times uh, the guys, uh, what is the common requirement uh, for exchanging the data between the client uh, and the server in RI? Okay, so here it is like little hint, you know. What's missing in here? One little piece. Oh, great. So. Did you see who it was? <laughs> no. Okay, see. We have some giveaways, so. <laughs> who was that? Just raise your hands. Okay, good. <laughs> so. Oops. How about this cup? <laughs> Should I throw it? Oh, just grab this one. Okay, so let's take a look at the, at the latest feature set we have in Arrive that we just uh, recently added in the last couple of months. And that's all centered around how to build user interfaces. Um, so Arrive UI, really is a declarative layout-based system that leverages HTML5 and CVI. Um, this, what we see here, you all know that, is a plain HTML file. It's completely uh, spec and standard conform. There's nothing fancy about it. Um, this uh, file can be viewed in the browser as is and edited and viewed, designed, whatever. So we also call it feature the designer template because a graphic designer could now for the first time actually give you their plain HTML and you could use it as a template in your app. Um, you don't need to run it through a templating engine to view it, like I said, you just view it in the browser. So there's only one special piece here and that's those data field attributes on the button or on the label. And they're, they're also HTML5 custom attributes, so they're also a standard conform part of, of HTML. So we need these data field attributes for one thing, so that we can in our companion Java class. So this is the companion Java class for that template you just seen. And the data fields in, in that input button, for instance here the input uh, for username has a data field username and we can inject that data field as a text box in the companion Java class. All we need to do is annotate that Java class we've templated which tells it that it's a templated class and it's gonna look for an HTML template with the same name as the class in that Java package. So it's gonna look for login form.html, but that behavior can obviously be customized once you pass uh, an attribute with a templated annotation to specify where the HTML file is, but that's optional. <laughs> so we get access to the DOM elements by injecting it directly into the Java class. That's good, but usually you wanna add some behavior to, to your uh, UI and that's what the event handler annotation is for. So you say um, an event handler for the submit button, like here, so that method will be invoked once uh, that, that button is clicked. Um, so what would happen next? So in, on login, you'd say, I don't know, user, user equals new user, user dot set name, text box dot get username, user dot set password, blah, blah. You, you know the drill. That's kind of boring, and that's exactly boilerplate, and we don't want to write that. Luckily, we have a two-way data binding system, similar to uh, what, for instance, AngularJS is doing. So what we can do, 
we annotate those data fields we found, and we have a data binder that provides us with a model object, in this case, the user. Now from this case on, by just using these two annotations, that user object is always bound to the UI. So when the UI changes, the user changes. When the user changes, the UI changes. So when you click, uh, when, when the button is clicked and on, uh, on login is called, you don't have to do anything because the user will always already reflect what happened in the UI in between. So you just say uh, login and pass your user object along. So what would happen next? Usually, let's say the login is successful, so we want to navigate away to the first page of the app to, to a welcome page. Um, we have a navigation framework for that. So again, like with everything in Mirai, you inject something. You, in you inject the page transition. You say transition to welcome page. And then you say on login successful, you would say welcome page go. And that's it. The good thing here is though, that this hooks into the browser's history. So when you navigate away to a page, the fragment identifier in your browser's uh, URL bar will, will update. So you get a new history token. Also, if the user hit, hits the back button or, or navigates away for some other reason, it will, it will trigger an event that causes that navigation framework to uh, display the page of the corresponding name. So a page is just a templated class like an inform or welcome page with one additional annotation that's called page. And it will be the name of that page that gets appended to the URL once you navigate to the page. Okay, so let's give the demo gloss <laughs> another, <laughs> another try. Let's okay. If they're better to us now. I'll give you the cable again. Yeah, I'm sure. Going outside to kill the chicken, but. <laughs> All right, so uh, for this second demo, um, uh, I would like to show you uh, how to make a fast uh, web app prototyping with uh, Array UI. And I've prepared uh, the presentation interactive uh, demo, which uh, I will be showing to you. And uh, they will, we will uh, go briefly through the code uh, to point out uh, what uh, are the uh, most important uh, parts, what Christian was already mentioning here regarding uh, Array UI. And then we will try to extend uh, uh, a little bit our application and put some additional features in it. Okay, so let me start the application first. Okay, this application, it's called, uh, it's just to-do list, uh, simple, uh, simple to-do list uh, to memorize uh, to memorize your items and uh, those items will be memorized once uh, you have finished with your item, you just uh, remove that uh, item from the list. So it takes a while. Okay, so. See, uh, this is our nice application. So we have uh, some to-do list items here. Hello, we did already say that. I did introduce to you uh, to to do demo list. Okay, so let's remove this one. We did this one as well. And uh, actually, I want to show you the template. So let's go back to the code and let's see what's uh, what's in there. You see. Uh, this is uh, this is our uh, our main uh, main app to do, and as you can see, uh, this actually it's annotated uh, with entry point. It means that our uh, that's our application. It's annotated with the templated, with, which means that uh, we are gonna use templates. If you uh, if you notice that uh, we have uh, in the same package like. Uh, to-do list app Java and to-do list app HTML. That means that this HTML, it's just a template for uh, our application. You know, here you can see the, here is the main attribute, which actually uh, uh, states that uh, the 
content uh, route will be uh, will be taken right from here you know okay so get it done for ri uh, hello for defcon just save it try to refresh it hello for defcon Okay, as I said, uh, the uh, main root content will be taken from, from here, from, so let's try to get rid of our really beautiful title. Oops, sorry, uh, it's in here. So, so we just switch it. The root content, we refresh it, so the title is gone. So let's put it back. And, uh, you know, uh, like, this is our uh, super duper secret uh, to-do list, and we do not want, like, uh, everyone to let in. So let's try to uh, put uh, there some uh, <coughs> login page functionality and try to uh, navigate into that application. I prepared it actually, so I will just, uh, I will just copy it there, let me find it. Just copying the, oops, no, <laughs> okay, and those two. I'm just copying login. What do we need more? We need uh, here the, okay, it's right here. It, go, it goes here, okay. And actually, let's check it, uh, what, what's in there, so. See, it's just, this is a template for the login page. So see, it's, it's fairly simple, you know. It's just uh, username and password uh, labels, and it's, uh, it's just, uh, yeah, bind with the data fields uh, to, the, to the login page. You can see, uh, you can see it here. Uh, here we have the username, password, uh, uh, we are injecting here, and we are binding to those uh, data fields. So, that's that's very simple. Where the uh, actually uh, what do we need to bring in uh, in our application now? Because uh, we have like two pages, you know, and so we need to navigate somehow after the user logs in. So we need to navigate uh, to our uh, main application, and that's uh, what uh, uh, we are defining right here. You know, like every uh, every page needs to be annotated uh, with this page annotation if we want it uh, for, for navigation. And you can see here is the attribute starting page, uh, which uh, uh, is uh, required just once. It, it uh, says that uh, this is like, uh, here starts the, our page lifecycle. Uh, here we are injecting uh, the navigation here, which allows uh, our code then to be navigated more uh, uh, we are defining here like uh, the transition to, uh, that means that uh, we will be, uh, uh, we will be, we want uh, transition to our main application. Uh, you can see here the post construct, uh, again this method uh, will be invoked as first, navigation, uh, yeah. Here, uh, look here, here is uh, like, uh, the core of our navigation, we are defining here the event handler. Uh, once uh, we are uh, yeah, clicking this submit button, so yeah, it will, it will just uh, go to the next, next page. So we brought it in. Let's actually see what happened, you know, in our live demo. Oh, see, we have like two two things in one, we actually don't want that. So what happened in here? Uh, yeah, we have here the post construct. We do not want that. 
we want uh, to be shown this after page is shown yeah like that we just added one more annotation we got rid of this main so let's try to log in uh, okay doesn't matter okay and now what happened I'm giving away this head for someone who knows what happened and what we have forgotten. Christian, can you count for me 10 seconds? Only uh, <laughs> <laughs> five seconds, we don't have much time left. 10 seconds. <laughs> no. One thing is missing there. Come on, guys. Okay, I'll show you. It's good you get to keep the head. No, I won't. Right here. Right here. What's missing in here? Did I hear the page annotation? <laughs> okay. So, we need a page annotation here. So, all the pages has to be annotated with page, so that's like, let's try it again. Okay. And log in. Did we save it? Yes, we did. Page annotation, great. Refresh it. We need to refresh it. Again, login. Here we go. Uh, well, actually, uh, we don't have probably much time. Yeah, uh, I prepared uh, some uh, more things in there. So let's uh, let's just uh, finish at this point. I think you you got like uh, pretty much uh, you know intro how to get uh, into that fast prototyping for the application. You see it's mainly, yeah. Okay, um, let me just quickly wrap up for 15 seconds. Um, we had prepared another quiz. Another uh, quiz, oh, out of this time, is great. So, <laughs> away <laughs> um, so you know, often you build an application and over the course of time you end up with this twisty maze of little callbacks, you end up in this mess. And with Mariah, we're really trying to avoid uh, getting into coding mess. And we really need uh, your feedback to make your framework better. So don't, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, Take this one. Team. You were very active. Okay. <laughs> um, so let's get in touch. And thanks. So guys, sketch. <laughs> oh. <laughs> hey, catch. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.